So, so actually, Nabokov, when he approached these questions, was interested not only in whether a text was authentic or not, but how imaginative it was, how strange it was, whether it had some kind of correspondence to another culture to which he wanted to link Russia by some sort of ethereal bridge. This was part of his project. Not just because he was interested in comparative mythology, but also because he wanted to rescue Russian culture from what he perceived as its isolation, partly its self-isolation by its, uh, re its governments that always leave much to be desired, and partly by the prejudices of foreigners who, for various reasons, always consider Russia something separate from Europe, unrelated to Britain, and so on and so forth. Yeah? And another reason he did this was because he wanted to suggest that Russian cultural antiquity had a great deal in common with British cultural antiquity, and thus Russia was not some Asiatic country with no possibility of self-governing self democracy or anything of this kind, but was, had the same rights, the same possibilities as any other European country. He was a Russian liberal. Yeah? And very often he uses Russian material in a very conscious way in order to to promote this liberal democratic agenda of the, of the emigre liberals who were anti-communist but not monarchist. So the hero of his novel Podvig is very ill-suited to life in exile. He can't deal with either the monarchist Russians or the smug Westerners who say, oh well, Lenin is really not that bad, you know, I mean, you know, a few people shot, it's okay, and so on. He unsuccessfully woos a girl whose surname, surname Zilanova, contains a Turkic word for serpent that we find in the names of Russian Baladic villains in the Wiedeli. He himself is constantly compared to Tristan. He's a romantic dreamer. And Sofya Zilanova runs off with his best English friend, a classmate whose name is Darwin obviously the most unromantic and rational name that Nabokov could come up with to, to contrast to his hero, Martin. Now Martin, Martin's mother's surname is Indrikova. That is to say, he bears the name of the unicorn of the Book of the Dove. Martin can't live in exile. He can't live in a world which accepts communist cruelties, um, bourgeois vulgarity. So he plans a clandestine, heroic podvik, an exploit, a movement back into Russia. He intends to go there secretly, not to be discovered. Now the unicorn, the Indrik, we remember, can travel through the secret subterranean passages of the world unhindered. It harms none. It purifies the waters. It represents truth in a world of lies. Martin is all of these things. He hopes to accomplish a like journey. But his is to end in his death off stage. We don't meet him anymore. He's probably arrested and shot by the Soviets spy because unicorns no longer survive in this world. No more in Russian novels than in Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. Most of Nabokov's heroes are misfits of some kind. The better sort, that is the ones who don't seduce little girls, are Russian liberal Democrats, well-bred, kindly intellectuals, outraged by the jaundiced belief in the West that Russia is intrinsically disposed to tyranny. So arguing against such a prejudice, Nabokov discovers ancient native roots of pluralism in Russia that he peppers his novels with. Self-government in small towns of the remote north, the same places where we find, in fact, the references to dualism in Povist Fremlich. The Republic of Novgorod in the Northwest, the region that is the center of the survival of all the Builinli, 
in particular, in particular the cycle of, of a merchant of Novgorod named Sadko with a great deal of interesting submarine mythology. The alternative cosmology of the Book of the Dove and the dissident sect of the Old Believers who are also mentioned covertly in various places. Together these constitute a kind of literary archaeological record of an alternative political and social Russia. It is a history then, cosmopolitan in its nature, that involves sources of heterogeneous origin as well, indicators of Russia's membership in a large multinational civilization, whether it be the Celtic civilization of Britain or the cultures of Iran and Armenia. This is an oikumene of culture, connected by the bridges of idea, ideas and art that give Russian literature its peculiar and compelling greatness. Not an empire secured by tanks, described by lying politicians, and maintained by bandits. The name of the Book of the Dove, Golubina Ekniga, may have been the simplification, as I've suggested, as others have, of an older name, Glubina Ekniga, the Book of the Deep Things, the Profound Mysteries, even as the Bundahishan described it, describes itself. But I should like to commemorate the great spirits of scholars of the past who try to bridge c cultures and who hover on their, on their wings above us, that this heavy, hoary book of 40 L's and 7 seals of old can also be seen, as we study it, as an opening into the future, taking flight, as the wings of a dove do, when the book finally opens into peace and into a place where unicorn and lion can live in harmony. Thank you very much.